at John Deere Junior High School from 1953 to 1962. He happens to be my husband's classmate too, so hooray for the class of 52 from Uh He coached golf and basketball for many years, and with Bob Van Boren, he wrote a history of Moline High School basketball that was published in 2008. He recently completed a short history of Browning Field that includes the scores of all Moline High School football games dating back to 1899. Kurt was a student in Jack's homeroom and geography classes in seventh grade at John Deere. Kurt went on to a career as a geographer holding faculty positions at the University of Illinois and the University of Southern California. Currently, he and Diane Moore are writing a book on the history of Wharton Fieldhouse, which includes a chapter on Browning Field. Uh, I don't know whether I mentioned, but his wife Libby is sitting up here too, if you have not met her. They're very active in the Farnham dinners that we all enjoy so very much, and they're busy working on them for this uh, late winter, too. Uh, today the program is 100 years of sports and community events at Browning Field in Moline. Let's hear it for Browning Field. is here. <laughs> he just made his grand entrance. Um, thank you very much. I uh, do want to recognize Jack. Jack, uh, as uh, Carolyn mentioned, was my seventh grade geography teacher. And I went on to a long career as a professional geographer. And uh, I guess it could be said that Jack planted one of the seeds that led, that led to that productive career. So I thank you. Uh, let me give you some background. Uh, when I started doing research for the Wharton Fieldhouse book, I realized that its history could not be separated from the history of Browning Field. So Diane and I will include in the book some substantial content related to Browning. Somewhere along the line, we discovered that October 5th of this year will be exactly 100 years to the day since the first high school football game at Browning. And on October 5th of this year, there will be a celebration. More about that in a moment. In the meantime, Jack had written a short story of Browning Field and also compiled all the high school football scores back to 1899. I have them on the table here if anybody's interested. They will be available later as part of this celebration. Um, so the two of us got together and we're helping plan the celebration. Uh, this presentation, in effect, is the first event that's part of that celebration. Um, and as Diane Moore mentioned, I'll do this same presentation again uh, on Tuesday, October 7th at Butterworth 7th. Second. Butterworth Center. Second. 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 Tuesday, October 2nd at 7 p.m. <laughs> <laughs> Unaccustomed as I am to public speaking. Um, so today, I'm going to concentrate on the early history of Browning. The title's a little misleading because I'm going to concentrate primarily on the first half of the 20th century. And by the way, we are actively seeking good stories, photographs, other images, memorabilia about Browning or Wharton uh, that we might use in the book. So if anybody has any ideas for us, we will appreciate that. Okay, let John T. Browning was born in New York in 1830, attended law school in Rochester, New York, and came to Moline in 1858 to set up his law practice. He served as the first city attorney under Daniel, uh, Mayor Daniel Wheelock and was elected as Moline's first library board president. Browning also served two terms in the Illinois legislature. 
Through his bountiful career, he managed to acquire quite a bit of land in Moline. During his illness of 1909 and 1910, Browning was planning to erect a huge granite monument to his memory. But Dr. A. M. Beale, who at the time was the president of the Board of Education, suggested there was a greater need for an athletic facility. <laughs> Dr. Beale said that such a field would be more, a more lasting monument to the memory of Browning than a piece of granite in a cemetery. <laughs> Browning agreed and signed a codicil to his will before he died in 1910 which gave to the city a large plot of land for use as an athletic facility. It became Browning Field. In 1912, a lar uh, an area large enough for a new football and baseball field was leveled. This entailed cutting the land down on the south side, creating an embankment that is still there. So if you ever go behind the south grandstands, you'll see that embankment. The dirt removed uh, was used to fill ravines on the west and east sides of the field, and the first bleachers were constructed. A large wooden grandstand on the south side and a quarter mile cinder running track were added in 1916, and the crescent shaped baseball grandstand was added, added in 1920. Here's a similar view after Warden Fieldhouse was added to the neighborhood in 1928. Note the baseball field in the upper part of the photo at the east end of the football field. And also, although you probably can't see it from the back, there's a running track that encircles the baseball diamond and crosses right across center field and right field uh, of the baseball area. Let me point that track out to you. Before moving to Browning in 1912, the Moline High School football teams played their games at a field on 4th Avenue in what is now the northwest corner of Riverside Park, just west of the lagoon. It was conveniently located near the streetcar line that served Riverside Cemetery, allowing easy access for fans coming from all over the city. In 1910, fire station number four, now a Moline historic landmark, was built on the site. Sorry. That was a good idea. Next. If you can. Can you see? No, I can see. It's fine. Uh, beginning in 1911, the team played two seasons at the nearby Moline Athletic Park, sometimes called Three Eye Park, for reasons that you'll see later. It was located on Fifth Avenue near 36th Street, actually Fourth Avenue. Today, the Moline Municipal Services Building is on that site. The maroon and white, as the Moline teams were known at the time, again played there in 1915 and 1916, while improvements were being made at Browning. Since 1917, the high school track and football teams both have used Browning Field continuously. Next. Moline High School was a powerhouse, was truly a powerhouse in football in the early 20th century. In their first 13 seasons, before they started playing in Browning in 1912, they were undefeated in three seasons and lost only one game in another four. In the undefeated season of 1904, they outscored their opponents 304 to zero. <laughs> and claimed, in that year and some other years, they claimed the unofficial state championship. In 1905, the Moliners outscored opponents 135 to six but they lost to Rock Island four to nothing. <laughs> in, in 1907, they lost only to Monmouth College. One early highlight was a high school world scoring record. That was in 1902 when Moline beat Galva 172 to nothing. Oh. <laughs> Jack, I'm not making this up, am I? <laughs> Next. Moline began practicing on the new Browning Field on September 18, 1912. That's 100 years ago tomorrow, right? And on October 5, 1912, played their first regular season game against Makokita. Just before that game, the dispatch uh, gave the following commentary. Browning Park is the best football field Moline ever had. The grounds have been put in first-class condition. 
A new feature being the wire fence to keep people off the gridiron. <laughs> the grandstand is near the sideline, and from it, every play of the game can be comfortably witnessed. In that first game, Moline beat Makoka to 34 to nothing. The dispatch commented that the Moliners won despite being greatly outweighed. The Moline team members ranged in weight from 120 to 165 pounds, and they averaged 145 pounds. It was a different world 100 years ago. Next. The team's winning ways continued. Moline did not have a losing season until 1920. A spectacular season was 1922, when the Maroons lost only to Champaign. Not counting that game, Moline outscored their opponents 488 to 14. The local lads were particularly hard on some smaller schools out in the hinterland. They beat Princeton 92 to nothing and Kiwani 93 to nothing. I just heard some snickers from the Rock Island contingent. <laughs> that year they beat Rock Island 54 to nothing. <laughs> Lights were put in place at Browning in 1930 on eight wooden poles. In the first night game, Moline beat East Moline 18 to nothing before 4,000 fans. The second night game, two weeks later, was a 39-6 victory over Dubuque in front of over 5,000 fans. Their star player was Jay, Bur Jay Burwanger, who went on to play for the University of Chicago and was named the first winner of the Heisman Trophy in 1935. 1936, the Maroons got their fourth undefeated season. <clears throat> Among the 1940s coaches are some names familiar to many in this room. From left to right are George Seneff, Harry Forber, Howard James, Roger Potter, Joe Vavris, and Bill Bean. <laughs> Willie McAdams in this photo leads the team from the field house through the right field fence onto the football field. Um, many, of you, many of you know Willie, he's been affiliated with the Historical Society for a long time. He's a modest fellow, but he was not only an athletic star, but he's also president of his high school class. The late 40s saw some more great teams. Moline lost only one game each in 1948 and 1949, and was undefeated in 1950. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> John's brother Dick is in that. For the 1951 season, high school football was promoted with this ad in the dispatch. In recent decades, the Moline football team has not been as dominant as, in early, as earlier in the century, although it's been pretty good at times. The last undefeated team was 1967, and from the time the state playoffs started in 1974, the Maroons have qualified for state playoffs in 16 seasons. They qualified six years in a row from 1995 through 2000, and four years in a row from 2004 through 2007. Next. In the early years, track and field, uh, the lads of track and field, the lads worked out of a small field north of and down the hill from the old high school building on 16th Street, now the Moline High School loft apartments. The space and facilities there were inadequate. This all changed in the spring of 1917 when Browning Field first welcomed the track team. The very first issue of the Moline High School newspaper, The Linotype, dated March 12, uh, 1917, announced the following. The school seems to have lost a great deal of interest in spring athletics. Possibly this is due to the fact that a suitable place to practice the outdoor work was not available. The Browning Field has now been fixed with a cinder track. This will make a good place for training, although it is rather far from the school. Now, don't you feel sorry for those lads they have to trudge all the way from 11th Avenue to 20th Avenue <laughs> for track practice? <laughs> nice. Track and field has been very important in Browning over the, ever since. In 1960, the Moline team, coached by Gene Shipley, won the state track title, the first downstate team to do so in 25 years. Since then, the track has been named after Shipley and 